God is our maker and our kinsman redeemer. He loves you so much and he just wants to give you a big hug and from our heart to yours. We are so glad that you're joining us for Hope Today. I'm here with Tom and Anna and we are gonna talk about a subject that impacts a lot of people yes. that you know are desperately searching for love. Yes, for that special someone, the future husband, future wife. And my question for you today is, have you ever written a love letter or maybe received a love letter from someone? Well, these letters spark within our hearts a sense of nostalgia, tender affection, and the blooming potential of the future to come. Imagine writing love letters to the man in the future who you will one day marry, but have yet to meet. So that's precisely what our guest Callie Logan started doing when she was 18 years old. And in just a few minutes, she'll join us to share her love letter journey while waiting for God's best. Tom, we are in a season where we're seeing more and more people in their late 20s, 30s, still waiting, praying, longing for their spouse. That's, re that's really true. And I think in, in a generation, actually generation before me, and I'm a couple, <laughs> couple of generations back, but a generation before me, uh, a lot of people got married very young, you know, and, and it's not happening that way so much anymore. And really, uh, it's, a, uh, it's probably uh, next to serving God, it's the most important decision you're going, going to make, yeah. you know, who, you, who you're going to marry, because the, you are joined then, you are one, and it's such an important thing to entrust to the Lord. I know this is something I talk to my girlfriends. I have two really dear friends, so I'm 35, they're turning 36, and they're still waiting. They're still, you know, searching and holding out hope to find the one and the husband. And so I know in my, like as a millennial right now, it's a very big thing. I know a lot of people, if you're out there and you're like, you've done the swipe left, swipe right with the, the dating apps, not really like a favorable place to be right now, but this is a serious thing. And we do see, you know, in our culture right now, when it comes to marriage, that people are getting married a lot later in life or they're having children a lot later in life and so this is definitely something that's on a lot of people in my generation this is a very common topic that I hear all the time so I'm really glad that Callie is with us and I understand you know the waiting it's 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 not it's not easy out there it's not how it was back in the day Tom hey well <laughs> back in the day it wasn't that easy believe me <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thankfully, God is uh, faithful to bring the right person along. And uh, I was, <laughs> I'm not going to start preaching here. You know, you got to be the right person too, hopefully, you know, before you are looking for the right person. But yep. we'll just leave that for later. Anyway, I want to mention uh, something. Today is voting day and please go out and vote. Go out and vote for godly people, for Christian people. Go out and vote for people that represent the values uh, that you hold as a Christian. Uh, I just want to remind you of that. It's easy when it's not a presidential election, it's easy to let some of these voting days go by. So please take advantage of the freedom that we have to vote and be sure that you do vote. That's right, yeah. it is a privilege for sure. Yeah. Uh, so well, our guest today, Callie Logan, when she was just 18 years old, started writing letters to the man she would one day call husband. Without knowing him, she began praying for him and sharing stories from her own life. And today she shares many of her letters with us in her book, Dear Future Husband. She joins us now to share what God has taught her in the waiting. So Callie, welcome to Hope Today. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so happy to be here. It's such a joy. We know you're gonna bring a lot of hope to those single men, single women out there. And so tell us, well, you were 18. What inspired you to write that first letter? You know, I have thought about it. And as much as I would like to say I think it was me, I think genuinely it was a, a God idea. I think at the time I didn't know it was a God idea. At the time, it just seemed like life was changing so fast. And I wanted to somehow kind of encapsulate all that was going on, like a message in a bottle. To, to share that memory with a spouse one day, but I really do believe that was something that God kind of prompted my heart to do. Have you always been a romantic? Like, is that sort of what sparked that in you that, oh, just kind of dreaming, daydreaming that teenage girl about her future husband? And I'm just wondering if, if the, there's a romantic side in you that's caused you to continue writing these letters throughout the years. Not necessarily. As odd as it is that I, I wrote a book on marriage, I just, I, as a teenager, I wasn't even sure I wanted to get married. 
and it was my senior year in high school. I was with a group of gals and they were all talking about their crushes and different things. And I was very serious. And I said, well, how are we sure if we're supposed to get married? And if we are, I don't want to waste my time just on all these, these random guys. I, I want to just be praying for and focus on what God has. Uh, and so I began praying kind of in that way and I actually started writing letters like a few weeks after that, but I, I have a romantic heart for, for sad love stories, but, um, I definitely am not in that kind of hopeless romantic rom-com <laughs> kind of story. Uh huh. So tell us a little bit about your personal journey throughout your twenties. You're 31 now. You are still, mm -hmm. still waiting for your husband. And so has yeah. it been a bit of a roller coaster ride going through seasons of feeling hopeful and then maybe feeling hopelessness? Take us through some of those real emotions. Yeah, I, it really has been a roller coaster. And I think one of the biggest things I've learned is just how good God is and how intentional he is and growing us and not giving us the things that we think we want when we want them. Um, there were definitely things within me that I know and I can stand just so much in gratitude that he's worked out things he's healed from childhood, uh, lessons I've learned through relationships that were just not his best, uh, and all those different things. And so I stand in such a place of just really being thankful that he has given me that time to get to know him more intimately and really place him as first love. And also just become a better version of myself, a more healed version of myself, uh, a happier version of myself along the way too. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Just um, having, Tom mentioned it briefly at the beginning, but just about how important it is, like God is preparing our hearts just as much as he is preparing the heart of the one that we will marry. Um, talk about that deep healing, what God did in your heart what he revealed to you about himself to give you that, that confidence in who he made you to be. Yeah, as you know, we are broken people and all of us have wounds. Not a single one of us has gone through life and especially reached adulthood without something that has impacted us or hurt us or that needs that loving hand of a father to repair us. And I'm really grateful and that God really took me into a deep season where I, I didn't do a whole lot socially. I wasn't dating at all. And it kind of felt like almost like an underground time period, but I did so much inner healing within me. And I came to know him more intimately. Um, so he had a Christian therapist that was really helpful too. And on the other side of it, it was hard going through, but on the other side of it, I came out with such a better understanding of knowing God personally as father, knowing Christ personally as bridegroom. And honestly, it has been the most worthwhile time. It was hard to go through and it wasn't easy, but I'm so grateful that he took me through that sanctification. He took me through those refinements because I also learned this is who God actually made me to be. Not everything everyone told me I was supposed to be and not everything everyone hoped I would be, but instead everything that God told me I am. And I'm really grateful for that. And I love that you said that, Tom, of just that experience of going through and becoming. I, I think there's that best version of you. And I think there's that, you know, God ordained his daydream of who you would be as well. Well, Kelly, I, I love that. I love that, you know, you're putting the, the right priority on, on letting uh, God have his way first in your life and, and to take his rightful place. But I'm just interested in these letters. I mean, what are you writing in these letters? I mean, what's in there? I mean, what, I mean, I, I, how many letters have you written? Well, so for my personal ones, there's, there's about 300. Okay, um, I don't know. I the, mean, the book is not 300. I don't know who, what guy is living up to these 300 letters and I just have to know, like, what are, what kind of things are you writing, writing in there? You know, it's a vast array. I think uh, it, primarily in the book, I wanted to make sure I didn't make this a memoir because the book isn't about me at all. I am just a great, very grateful vessel to carry out a message from God for his children. And so the letters are filled with vulnerable experiences that I think women and, and men alike will find relation to of relationships that they thought were, you know, they thought in themselves were best. And God said, nope, <laughs> that's not my best for you. 
or uh, times of just feeling lonely and fatigued and sad, of feeling that strain of, man, it is really hard that it's the holidays. And yet again, I'm sitting here with an empty seat next to me at the dinner table. Um, but then there's also big milestone events of, you know, being at a graduation or a job promotion or kind of finally figuring out some, some big marker or cornerstone. But there's also tips and things of, hey, maybe there are some things that God needed to work out in me because the person that God has for me in particular needs that. Um, I cover talking about relearning how to manage conflict. Um, as a child, you know, you're taught one way and you witness those around you and how they manage conflict. But there's a difference between that and then perhaps how God wants you to manage conflict. And so I go into that in one of the letters. So it's kind of a survey of all those things. There's also some quirky, fun, just happy little memory things as well. Um, just to serve as encouragement. It's it's not all meat. There's, there's a few potatoes in there, too. <laughs> You know, Kelly, just hearing you about like the letters that you're writing to your husband, I know there's a lot of us as women, we have those moments, we write to him. I know there's a moment I even prayed for like my future husband as well. And But I just want to ask you, because something that you spoke of and you just touched on, because I think it's a very real thing, you know, being in your 30s and waiting on God, waiting for that spouse, but the heartbreak that when you're in a relationship and you think, could you, you know, that maybe this is going somewhere and then it doesn't happen. Can you just share like any moments of like when you experience heartbreak and the disappointment? Cause I have girlfriends where they're, you know, dating a guy, things are going along well, and then you're thinking maybe this could be it. And it's not, that's like a hard, it's a hard place to be. Oh, it is. And um, I, I, my heart goes out to women who, or in men who are experiencing that, or just feel that dissonance within them that maybe something isn't quite right. You don't have that godly rooted peace and you're just waiting for for the time when he'll he'll yank that out. But I remember in particular, and I, I do cover this in the book, there was a kind of a situation ship, if you will. I think the millennials have really cornered the uh, the market on having situation ships <laughs> instead of genuine relationships there. But I had really liked this guy on paper. He looked absolutely perfect. We got along super well. We had similar humor. Um, my friends were all rooting for it, and it seemed like it was going to go really well, but there was just something within that didn't give me an absolute peace. And so I really began steadfast. I was really praying about it. And I woke up one morning, and God dropped the bomb on me and said, he's not my best for you. And that was hard because I had to grieve everything that I was hoping it potentially could be, and then also grieve everything that it was not, uh, and have faith and trust God that he would carry me through and that there was something else and something better that that implied that he had a best and that this wasn't it. And so that's a hard place to be. But I think letting yourself grieve that, letting yourself go through the emotion and not just bottling it up and sweeping it under the rug is important. But I think too, looking at it from an angle of hope that, okay, God, you are a good father who gives good gifts. And so I'm going to trust that you have something even more glorious than I can even potentially imagine. And um, if this was good, I can't wait to see your best. Thank you for your transparency and sharing that. And, you know, just being very real about the low feelings, the grief that you have to go through, but as you walk through that grief to hold on to the truths of God's word and his promises to you. Uh, Callie, I want to ask you, do you feel like our society or maybe even the church more than society idolizes marriage? I do. I think as well-meaning as the church is, and I think at times society tries to be well-meaning with it as well to kind of have that almost Disney fairy tale happily ever after. And they look at marriage as almost this end all be all, you know, think of movies in the market and how you, you crave to see, you know, the, the guy and the gal get along in the end. Um, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about it, but there is when we place that of more importance than our relationship with God. Because by definition, an idol is anything that we're saying is more important than God. And when it comes to relationships, it doesn't have to even just be a relationship. It can be just the idea of having that, you know, house with the picket fence and everything. It could be that for this season and the next season, it's, oh, well, I really want a baby or I really want a job. It's anything that you're saying is more important than God. And God makes it really clear that he's a jealous God for our hearts. 
And truly and genuinely, when you have the opportunity, the beautiful opportunity to know him intimately, you see that nothing on this earth, nothing on this planet, no fame, no wealth, no person is ever going to satisfy the way Jesus does. And so I think that's where we have to do a good heart check-in, be really honest, and bring that before the Lord. And if he's not first, then he's last. And we need to take it to him and say, God, help me. I want you to be first, and I want you to be my best. Callie, you know when that best comes along, there's still going to be a lot of knockdown, drag out situations. Just, just letting you know, okay? <laughs> I married the best possible woman in the world for me, and she would probably say the same thing. And there was a bit, a lot of uh, dragging each other along and uh, uh, various things and fights and forgiveness. I'm just saying how it really is here. You know, I mean, I just want everybody out there to realize that's part of it. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like Jean, Jean is probably texting you She's right here. now. We can, I mean, she texts, she says it's a good show. So, you know, there, everything's going good. There we go. Yeah, I mean, let's just speak into that too, because I think there's this mindset that life begins once we're married, but truly, like I even heard Cindy mention this very recently that like the wedding day, somebody said it's like, it can be like a funeral day because yeah. that's when we start yeah. truly. Well, we're a bunch of happy folks but, here oh, today. No, I don't know, it's yeah. like a funeral. <laughs> understand because I'm like I'm 35 and I understand it my heart is just like I but somebody did tell me it is like a funeral service you know it's like you go to the altar mm -hmm. and it's like a part of death and so but I understand the um the cat like the the chasm that is between like there's this yearning of like I don't want to be by myself anymore I want to have you know be married and have a family and all those things and then it's the other side like girl I'm gonna keep it all the way real I was like what did I get myself into <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I, I was 29 and I was like, oh Lord, I've had to be on my knees and pray. <laughs> but my friends that I talk to know about this too, but we just appreciate your, your heart and your transparency about this because this is something in our culture a lot of people are talking about like right now, especially as millennials. Yeah, yeah and I think like marriage, yes. Yeah, marriage begins to show us our own selfishness and our own it's things true. that we have to die to ourselves and live for what the Lord has called us to. Um, can you just speak into that about, for, for anybody who just feels like, well, life really doesn't begin until I get married. I think, oh my gosh, like that would be sad. I do think that would be so sad if life didn't begin until you got married, because I think your worth and value are not dependent on if you are an MISS, an MS, or an MRS. It is totally dependent on God. And it's just such a joy in that. Uh, and I think, too, just recognizing that you have this really specific timeline for your life. And all of that begins the minute you take your first breath, you know. And, and that's when life really begins. Because... I think about, I think if life really began when we got married, we'd be born married. You know, there would be some very interesting cataloging system where you would just be born with a spouse. But God has so much more, and that's not to diminish marriage, but just to say that God came to give life and life abundantly. Jesus did in John 10, 10. Uh, I've been thinking a lot recently about abundance and what that really looks like. And I think abundance is living life fully and the highs and the lows and the good and the bad and all of that begins with your first breath you know yeah amen i mean truly callie you are 31 and you are living into the person god made you and first and foremost he made you to have relationship with him and you are experiencing him as your first love mm -hmm. and then enjoying life as the woman that he made you to be while you enjoy his presence. And so we just wanna say thank you for your heart, for your transparency. I know that many singles will be able to relate to the letters of Dear Future Husband, a love letter journey while waiting for God's best. And God truly does have the best out there for you and each person who is still praying for that special husband or wife. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. God bless you guys. God bless you.
All right, well, we got to take a quick break, but as you can see, we are passionate about this topic. We all have different experiences, and so we're going to continue to bring it right after this. In this month of Thanksgiving, we're excited to send you this special daily gratitude journal with your best gift. This easy to use journal will encourage you to bookend each day with short personal reflections that bring insight and intentionality to your busy and always changing life. How can six simple questions help you better navigate life's uncertainty? Best-selling author Tish Oxenreiter invites you to lean into the rhythms that each morning and evening offers with a twice daily thought exercise focusing on gratitude, truth, grace, and more. As you reflect on three key questions near the beginning and end of your day, you will be more poised and prepared for whatever God has for you in the hours between. Request your gratitude journal today when you give. Call 888-665-4483 or donate online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for giving to Cornerstone Television. Well, we are super excited that you're joining us for Hope Today because even during the break, the three of us have just been talking and bouncing off and like Tom was like, it's about, we're getting real, like we need to talk about this and we are fired up because we need to talk about the state of relationships. So Tom, please share your heart. I know you are revved up and ready to go. Well, I just, uh, look, well, I was uh, just my own story, super shy growing up and not, not really dating or anything. And I just entrusted it to the Lord at one point when I was finally, you know, really serving the Lord, uh, it was like, God, I'd like to be married. I'd like to have a Christian girlfriend. I ended up meeting Jean and she's the greatest woman on earth. And she thinks I'm a pretty good guy. And so I think that, that we have a great relationship. I know we do, but that doesn't mean that it's uh, not going to be knocked down, drag out sometimes. <laughs> it has been, not physically here, you know, just uh, <laughs> emotionally, uh, there, there's real tension. You've got, mm -hmm. <laughs> who said, uh, you have a, one sinner marries another sinner. Pretty soon you have a whole bunch of sinners in the house. You know, it's like we all, uh, you know, and we all love each other, but there's passionate things that happen that are going to pull on our flesh at times. And, and we are going to have to work those out. Iron sharpens iron, as we always say on our sister to sister show here. But uh, that that is not a fun process all the time. Right. Yeah, I think um, what I would what I would encourage you with is when God says in his word to be equally yoked like that. Oh, that is such a good principle um, because there are so many different things that have to be worked out in a relationship. And when you're both when you both have Jesus as the center of your relationship, then you are uh, looking for his direction for what the Holy Spirit is saying. And um, like with my experience, so I am in my mid forties. I went through the tragedy of seeing a 20 year marriage implode. And so then after I got married at 20 years old, so I was very young. And then in my forties, I'm like back into the dating scene. And I know there's some of you out there who are back in that you're navigating, you're trying to figure things out. And believing that God does have that person out there who is exceedingly abundantly beyond anything that we can think or imagine. And he does not want us to compromise um, our standards, our values, knowing that he does have our best in mind and it's in his time and in his way. And I mean, I just, this will be my first official little announcement that I, I, have, I have a wonderful man in my life that I've had for the past year. And Dennis, I bet you're watching. <laughs> All right, Dennis, <laughs> way to go, yeah. Dennis. <laughs> and it truly is beautiful yeah. to see how God does redeem really uh, tragic situations and just the joy that I'm experiencing. We haven't had any drag outs, you know, like, Oh, you, got lots of, you got lots of time for that to happen. But yes. Well, I love this conversation so much, and we just, we're just grateful that you're tuning in and you're watching and listening to us because we all come from different perspectives. And, you know, just even listening to Callie's story, like, I can relate. I remember being, you know, in my 20s, and I think there, because there's this lie. Let's, can we just, let's just keep it all the way real. You go, you get, you go to college, you get your job, you try to meet 
your husband, <laughs> have the house of kids, and it don't work out that way, right? And I think a lot of, like my generation, we realize like crap is falling apart. I have all these issues. <laughs> I'm waiting on God, you know, I'm trying to wait for the right one and it's hard. And my story in college, like, oh, I was like in love with, the, like I was this guy and that guy. And God would say, no, I mean, I have all these crazy stories where like, it, I can't even go there, it's not even, and another time I might have to go into the story, but even there was a situation like I was dating a guy and we were going to pre-engagements, okay? I thought I was gonna marry the guy when I first came to Cornerstone and they know here. I thought I was gonna be married to this guy and it didn't happen and I was heartbroken and I was devastated. I was like, oh my gosh. And then I just had to wait more and praying and then you know, got married to my husband Jake. And so I've just been on this journey, but I understand the waiting. And there's a scripture in the Song of Solomon that God gave me in my season of waiting and don't awaken love until the time is right. That it is so important that I believe, like having God in my process, like there was men, listen, I understand what she's saying, on paper they look good, on their face look good, and God said no, and I said, come on Jesus, what's going on? But it's so important to have God in the midst of it because guess what, my mentor, Reverend Dion, she told me this, she's like, marriage is two people who love God, who love each other, and you gotta have Jesus in the center of it because we all know, after that wedding day, I don't care what nobody oh, say. Man. It is tough. It is hard. You have Jesus in the center. You I don't do. know how people who don't have Jesus <laughs> in the center even make it because you got to have someone yeah. that you're both, you know, oh. reaching towards. And I just want to say this. Look, I said something about be the right person. Look, when you're married, maybe you're married now, you got to have that other person. That other person needs to have the freedom to follow Jesus in that relationship. Don't suppress each other. Don't like, uh, you know, shush each other down. Everybody's got to, they've got to express themselves and they got to follow passionately Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, get that, get that triangle thing. If you're over here and Jesus is in the center and you're following, you're getting closer to each other as you get closer to Jesus, okay? so. Let your spouse be the person they were meant to be. I'm not going to preach right now because. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. Okay, so one of the best pieces of advice that I got is to, get, before you start dating, be okay in your singleness and the person that God made you to be and work on your healing, like Callie said, because when a whole person comes together with another whole healthy person, yeah. you yeah. multiply each other and what God wants to do through you as a couple on this earth. But when like a half a person gets together with a half a person, you like suck life out of each other and it depletes what God has planned for you as husband and wife. So keep pursuing God, pursuing healing, pursuing his best, for you because he loves you. He wants you to have that special somebody, but he wants to be your special someone first. Thanks for being with us. Have a great day.